for supplies with coded messages. Make a quicksand quagmire and watch things disappear without a trace. And how to make your own salt to sprinkle on your fish and chips. A super frisbee challenge. How to make a frisbee that really goes for a spin. Make your own all natural fizzy soft drink. And discover the secret to becoming a flying superhero. But first, Catch, Jason. Oh dear, frisbee throwing's not my forte. Maybe you just need to find out a little more about how frisbees work. I think you're right. Perhaps I could learn a thing or two from what Angelique's about to do. <laughs> we always play the same old game. I think it's time for a change. I'm going to make a frisbee. The trouble is, I'm not really sure what makes a frisbee work well. So here goes. Paper plates have the right shape. And they sort of fly. I'll stick two of these together to make a wing shape. Sticky tape around the edges. And there we are. Time for a test flight. Hey! Yes! It's airborne. Give it a flick. Not bad, but it seems to wobble about a bit. I think I need to improve the design. James and I have heard that you can stick a skewer through a balloon without it breaking. I don't think so. Nope. Maybe it's got to do with how stretched the balloon is. When it's stretched out, the skin is really thin and the point goes straight through. But where it's not so stretchy, the skewer presses in further. Hmm. So let's blow up another one, but not too much. Not so stretchy here, so I'll poke the skewer in there. not breaking. So if I push it straight through until it comes out the other end where the balloon isn't so stretched, yes, it went right through. How cool is that? The colour of the balloon is darker where the balloon is least stretched. This happens around the neck of the balloon and the tip. By pushing the skewer through these areas, the balloon is able to stretch around the skewer tightly enough so the air doesn't escape. We have proved that you can put a skewer into a balloon without it bursting. Now James's turn. Careful. Not careful enough, obviously. <laughs> Joseph is always being crazy about superheroes. In fact, he's obsessed. I think he sometimes thinks he is a superhero. I'll show him what a superhero looks like. Got him. I must admit, it really does look like I'm flying. But it's the oldest trick in the book. Just a simple mirror is all it takes. Just stand with one leg either side and slowly lift the foot in front of the mirror. The mirror image of one side of the body looks pretty similar to the other side, so the viewer is tricked into thinking both legs are in the air. I better give Mr. Superhero a turn. Oh no, now Joseph's in superhero heaven. He really thinks he can fly. 
You know, Jason, I had a suspicion that superhero stuff was all done with smoke and mirrors. Yep. Whizzing through the air at high speed is more difficult than it looks, as Angelique is finding out with her fancy frisbees. My first frisbee was okay, but I think it could do with more lift. I've seen real frisbees with holes in the middle. So if I draw a circle around a bowl and cut out the middle, same with the other, join them together and reinforce them with more tape. This looks far more like a frisbee, so I hope it's going to fly. We have takeoff. Catch. Well, it's a bit better. It gets a bit of height, but it doesn't seem to fly very flat and smooth. I'm sure I can make a better one. Don't give up, Angelique. Scientists are still using frisbee shapes to build that ultimate aircraft, the flying saucer. The circular wing shape is supposed to make for super smooth flight. But let's face it, a ride in a flying saucer is not everyone's cup of tea. I've got some pretty interesting creatures in my backyard. Some huge elephants. That leave some pretty huge, you know what, behind them. Hmm, smells interesting. Time I took a closer look at this pile of stuff. I'm not touching it with my hands though. I'll just get a magnifying glass and my trusty trowel. Now let's see. Elephant dung must be full of leftover goodies. These dung beetles think so. These incredible insects will eat their way through this pile of dung in no time. They love this stuff. This little chap even thinks it's take away junk food. I wonder what their attraction is. Hmm, all of this is giving me a headache. That reminds me. Some African people use smoke from elephant dung as a traditional cure for headache. I just use my magnifying glass to get the dung smoking. And inhale the fumes. I'm feeling better already. Poor old Blake. He's got all of those balloons to blow up before the party starts. And he's running out of puff. I think he needs help. Oh dear, he's completely breathless. Yep, he needs help. That method is so old school. We're gonna need an empty soft drink bottle, something to wipe up the mess, a funnel, a spoon, a bottle of vinegar, and some baking soda. Now I'll just half fill my soft drink bottle with vinegar. And with my funnel, tip a tablespoon of baking soda into a balloon. Stretch the balloon over the top of the bottle. The baking soda hits the vinegar and fears city. The soda and vinegar react to form a gas called carbon dioxide. It's the same gas that's in soft drinks. But here, the gas bubbles up under pressure. And here's his balloon. All pumped up and ready to go. So Blake can save his breath and I can get ready for the party. Hope that party isn't going to be a fizzer. <laughs> well, it sure won't be if they use our baking soda and make some fantastic fizzy drinks like Margo's about to do. Hmm, what is there to drink? Ah, the last one. Hey! I was too slow. Ah, she can have it. I'll make my own soda. What flavour do I want? Orange or lemon? Orange, I think. And a jug of iced water? Glass, juicer, baking soda and sugar. In goes the flavour. All natural, of course. None of the artificial stuff for me. Into the glass. Top it up with water. And
And now for the fizz. All that bubbling is the result of a chemical reaction between the acidic orange juice and the baking soda, which is the base. They react to produce carbon dioxide. This is what makes canned drinks fizzy, but in factories the carbon dioxide is added by pressure. It'll need a little sweetening. And it's done. Mmm, not bad at all. It sure tastes better than a drink that's out of a can. Whoa, that fizzy drink looks fantastic. It's amazing what can be done with simple ingredients and a bit of backyard know-how. And backyard know-how is exactly what Angelique's applying to the new design of her super duper frisbee. Two frisbees made so far today. The solid paper plate one was pretty basic, but flew fairly well. I modified it with a hole in the middle. I got the lift I expected, but it didn't seem to fly smoothly over long distances. But now I've got an idea for a frisbee that should fly really well. I need two milk cartons cut down the middle on two sides next to each other. Then cut away a quarter of the carton, leaving this bit for a tap. Then trim off the ends and you're left with a shape like this. Then do the same for the other carton. Fold the carton back together. Then cut strips about the width of your thumb up to the fold, along the entire length of the carton. Do the same with the other one. Fold it into a triangle, staple the bottom together, then join up the two cartons with the tab sticking inside. Staple it so it holds together. And join the circles up, stapling the tabs. And there you have a milk carton frisbee. Cool! Let's see how this one works. Hey! Launch time! Catch it! Give it some spin. Yes! It works brilliantly! It's got the height, distance and it doesn't wobble. When you throw a frisbee like this one, the shape is like a spinning wing. The spinning gives it stability, stopping the wobbling. And the wing shape gives it lift as it flies through the air. Wow! The faster we throw it, the more spin our frisbee gets and the further it flies. Whoops! Maybe there's more work to do on accuracy. We're camping out tonight. If we ever manage to get this tent pitch. Perfect, we're done. Now what about a way to communicate with the inside world when it's time for our midnight snack? Yay! A torch, not bad. But I think we can go one better. Come on you two, every brilliant scientist has loyal assistance. Stand by for room service. We're making the next best thing to a phone. Oh no, Sophie's stuck. She can't move her feet. The dreaded quicksand is sucking her in. It'll swallow her up. Just kidding. I saw quicksand in a movie once. It's real too. But how does it work? Let's try and make some. We'll need a bucket of sand and a collection of rocks and shells. Now down to business. We'll need an empty plastic container. I'll get Soph to cut a hole in the bottom. Yep, that's about the right size. We'll put our shells and rocks in the container to stop our sand from falling straight out the hole. Now I'll tip in the sand. Pat it down. And here's our little quicksand victim. She thinks this is solid sand, but it won't be soon. Because the essential ingredient of quicksand is water. We'll stick the hose in the hole at the bottom. It'll be like an underground spring that never runs out. Now our quicksand is ready. 
Oh dear, our little girl is sinking. Quicksand is particles of sand supported by water rather than other sand particles. Sort of like sand mud. A cushion of water keeps the grains of sand from bumping into each other. The sand isn't strong enough to bear the weight of anything resting on its surface. So things can disappear without a trace. Help, help, rescue me. She's almost gone. That was quick. I suppose that's why they call it quicksand. Now where did I put that magazine? Oh, what's this? Slides? I wonder what they look like. I don't think we have a slide projector. But I know another way of finding out. Hmm, there's a torch in here somewhere. Yep. Magnifying glass, elastic band, tracing paper. Okay, tear off enough to cover the torch. On it goes. Hold it with the elastic band. Now, what's on this slide? Use the magnifying glass to sharpen up the picture. That works. Now I need to find a dark room. This will do. Off with the light. Showtime. Now who is this? Focus it with the magnifying glass. Oh, Dad! Maybe this wasn't such a good idea after all. Oh, I'm with Blake. At least he could turn it off with a flick of a switch. Funny you say that because the flick of a switch is exactly how John plans on getting room service for his fellow campers. I promised you the next best thing to a telephone and here it goes. Start by dismantling the torch. We need the bulb and the battery. Attach positive and negative leads to both sections. And with a continuous current running between the battery and the bulb, we can activate the light. Easy! Now for the tricky part, making a switch. Bend the paper clip into an S shape and fasten the drawing pin. Connect the wires, and there you go. I've made a Morse code switchboard. Pretty high tech, hey? Not so high tech, actually. Morse code was developed more than 150 years ago. These funny markings make up the code alphabet, a series of dots and dashes, which are sent in short and long electrical pulses along a wire. Ready to order room service. After it was invented, Morse code became a very important way of getting messages to people a long way away. By tapping on a switch, dots and dashes making up words could be transmitted along wires. How do you tell the difference between a dot and a dash? A dash lasts three times longer than a dot. The most used letters of the alphabet have fewer dots and dashes in them, so the message can be sent as quickly as possible. Angelique and I have made a really cool terrarium for our plants. But what's the use? It's so foggy inside, we can hardly see our plants. I wonder why. They say leaves give off water, but surely not that much. Maybe Angelique and I should find out. We'll get two different sized leaves from the same tree. So we'll need two jars, and tip exactly the same amount of water into each jar markings on the side of the jar. That'll show us how much the water level changes. Now we put our leaves in so their stems stick into the water. Now how to get the water to evaporate only from the leaves, not from the water in the jar? Hmm, I know. Oil floats on water. Pour it on top of the water, that'll trap it in. Any water loss is through the leaves. Now we wait. Oh look, just as we thought, the bigger leaf has given off the most water. 
plants evaporate water through openings in their leaves. It's called transpiration. Plants transpire about 99% of the water they absorb through their roots. The greater a plant's leaf area, the more water it loses. Now we know what to do with our terrarium. If we don't want it to look all foggy inside, we should only put small leaf plants in it. Sophie and I are crazy about the beach. Sun, sand, surfing, and fish and chips for lunch. But we seem to spend all day feeding our faces. That's because we need to keep our strength up for hours on the waves. And here's our favourite bit. We make our own sea salt to sprinkle on our fish and chips at lunchtime. I just scoop up a bit of seawater. Done. Now let's have a surf and see what happens. Now for some fun on the waves. Oh, this is cool. Whoops. Sophie copped a mouthful of salty water. Sea water contains a lot of salt. While Ben and Sophie are spending the day surfing, the sun keeps shining on the seawater in the foil dish. The dish gets hotter and hotter and heats the water in it. Heat helps the water evaporate quickly, and when all the water has disappeared into the air, salt crystals are left behind. Mmm, all this surfing sure gives you an appetite. Now our favourite lunch, fish and chips, sprinkled with fresh salt from our own seawater. But not lots, because too much salt's not good for your body. Yum! I like a sprinkle of salt on my fish and chips too, but some people prefer a squeeze of lemon. Speaking of lemons... James always wins our juggling competitions. I'm hopeless at juggling, but there's one challenge I think I can win. I'll send him off for a jug of water while I peel this lemon. Just fill the bowl with water. Now the challenge. Will James pick which one of these will float in the water? Good, he's gone for the peeled lemon. He thinks it's lighter, which it is. But watch. Ha ha, he didn't expect that. Straight to the bottom. Now this is the heavier lemon. But it floats. The rind of a lemon contains thousands of tiny air bubbles, which allows it to float. The peel acts like a life jacket, giving this lemon a floating chance. At least I won that challenge. Good old Daniela. She's always up for a challenge. I think those campers are facing a challenge too if they want to get Sophie to wait on them hand and foot. We've come to connect our second Morse code board in Sophie's room. All she needs to do is to swat up on her Morse code alphabet. Now we're all set to communicate with Soph when we need supplies from inside. Happy studying, Soph! Right, let's see if we have the technology. And bring some chocolate. What's she doing? Why isn't she bringing us our chocolate? I've got an idea they'll keep her on the ball. This bug will make her sit up and take notice when we need her. And more importantly, when we need chocolate. All I have to do is wire it into her room. I think they got the message. Hey, what do all those dots and dashes mean? We've got to dash. Yep, we've got to dash. Because oh. we've reached the end of another backyard sign. Bye, Bye for, for now. now.